The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, do you believe it would be right to pay a woman to clean the church building? Oh, absolutely. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about that this evening and some things related to it. Good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. You're watching Search the Scriptures. I'm going to let Trevor, my partner, introduce himself and the brethren in Payette. Yeah, thanks, Keith. My name is Trevor Campbell. I do preach in Payette, and I worship there with a group that meets on Highway 62. And we're located on the north side of the highway. You can reach me at the number there on the screen, 870-435-2737. If you have a question for the program or you just want to call and talk some Bible with me, feel free to give me a call there. And if you're in the Marion County area and like to worship with us, we do meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for a Bible class. That's an open discussion of the Word of God. And then 10.45 a.m. is our worship service. So come out and join us if you're in that area. You folks over in Marion County, be in touch with Trevor. Let him know what your questions are and go by and worship with the folks there in Piatt. You will be benefited and they will be encouraged. Of course, I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. We have our services at 10 o'clock for Bible classes on Sunday morning, classes for all ages. We have our worship assembly at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and then we meet again at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We have a Wednesday evening assembly and Bible study at 7 o'clock, and then we have also, and we will invite you ladies to this, a very good ladies Bible class that meets at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. So you're invited to all those services at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. To get to our building, you'll turn south off of the 62-412 bypass around Mountain Home and uh, go on Highway 5 towards Salesville. Go down a mile. We're on the left. You'll pass Good Samaritan on the right. Then look on the left. You ought to immediately see the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. Come out and meet with us. Now, if you have questions from me, you can call me, Keith Sharp, at 870-321-5746, or you can email me at keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or if you prefer to write, you can certainly do that, uh, to Post Office Box 263 in Mountain Home, 72654. Let us know what your questions are, your questions, generate the subject matter on this program. Well, Trevor, the question we have is, may a church pay a woman for her work, uh, and uh, Christian and non-Christian? So go ahead and tell us about that, please, Trevor. All right, well, you know, I think the fact is um, we already do so. Um, you know, if your congregation partakes of the Lord's Supper, for instance, then, you know, where does that bread come from? Where does that grape juice come from? Well, it comes from vineyards, it, well, first from the store, I guess. You go and purchase it from the store. But if you were to backtrack the, the history of that bread, the flour, the oil, the, the grape juice, all those components of the Lord's Supper, well, women have had their hands on that. You're, you're, you are paying women, you're paying both men and women who have, who have brought, that, uh, you know, brought that to you, brought that to pass. So uh, I think it's already done. But, uh, you know, as far as the, the topic of women in the, you know, in the church and their work, Keith, it, it comes up a lot. But the Bible's very clear that, you know, the distinction between men and women is that women are not to have authority to teach over a man or have authority over a man. And that's, that's really it uh, when it comes to uh, the work of the church. So can, can women do the, the other things that men can do? Yes. Um, and certainly they can be paid. There, there's a precedent set even in the old law. Now, the old law, we're to learn from it. We're to look at these things, and, and they're to teach us uh, about God and who he is and some of the things that he expects. Most of those things are carried over, many of them, into the new covenant. Um, and, you know, I like to go to Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, it's a time of restoration for the people of Israel. And Nehemiah has come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. The temple has already been rebuilt. This is after it had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And so this is many years after that. But Nehemiah returns and he's getting things back in order, so to speak. One of the things that we see is that he's very big on not letting the, the house of God be neglected. 
And so it's not just the temple itself, but the work that goes on at the temple. He wants everybody to make sure that uh, those who should be paid for their services are paid for their services. And in Nehemiah chapter 10, he talks about this very thing. And I'm not going to read the whole text. You can do so on your own time. Uh, but he talks about the offerings for the house of God. In the very last verse, in verse 39, he says, For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offerings of the grain, of the new wine, and the oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. All right, so the temple of God and the services that are performed there, they needed supplies for those things. They needed supplies for the priest and for the Levites uh, who worked there as well and assisted the people. These are spiritual leaders. And so, yes, you know, spiritual leaders, people in a leadership position doing a work for the local church, I think this translates very nicely, that they are to be provided for and taken care of. We, we at Payette, whether it's myself or someone else gets up behind the pulpit and preaches the word of God, we, we pay that person. They put a lot of hours and energy and time into preparing a sermon and a lesson to be studied. And to get up and do it is also a great effort. They do that, we, we pay them for their services. I know that the same is true of women that teach other women. You know, sometimes there may be a ladies' Bible class, and certainly we're permitted to and authorized to pay that woman who teaches the ladies' Bible classes. You know, over in Highway 5, a few months back in the month of August, and they do it every year, they have this ladies' lectureship. I'll call it that, Keith. Hopefully that's yeah, the right term. That's, that's right. Okay, all right, where they have women come from other areas and teach other women. They have... They had about 100 women, from what I understand, this last time. A lot of women came for that. And so you had women teaching women. And I believe, from what my understanding, they paid those women who That's came. That's correct. And, all right, very good. Came and preached to those other women and taught them. That's right. That's good. And, and you know, it's interesting. We can go back to the old law and see these things taking place. I'm going to stay in Nehemiah just for a moment. And, again, it matters not whether it's a man or a woman. But in the old law, again, in Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah, he was the governor. He was also a spiritual leader. He left the place of Jerusalem for a period of time and then returned. And when he came back, he found out that the house of God had been neglected. And what he found is that the, the priest and the Levites, I think especially the Levites, it makes mention of, um, had to leave their posts, so to speak, and go back to working in the fields to provide for themselves because the people weren't providing for them. Well, that's wrong. Uh, that, that was not a good situation. And so the house of God was neglected. So in Nehemiah chapter 13, take a look, if you would, beginning in verse 10. This is right after Nehemiah returns. He says, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers. Now he's going to listen, people there. I'm going to skip over that. But these were considered faithful men, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. And then he says, Remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of God and for its services. So, you know, how does something like this, a text like this, translate to today? I think it translates very nicely that the house of God today is the Lord's people. It's the church, right? You can, you can go to various texts, including uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, where Paul tells Timothy that the house of God is the church of God, the church of Christ, that is. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, is another good text. Also, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, is another text that shows that God's church is the temple today. There's no physical temple but we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 is another one. Um, but we have local places of worship. Well, those local places of worship, those houses of worship, need to be preserved and kept up and, and ready for use every time that the assembly comes together. And so that means it needs to be cleaned and swept and orderly and taken care of. It may need maintenance done on it. Uh, we need supplies like the, the items for the Lord's Supper, the bread, the fruit of the vine. Whether you make your own bread, some congregations do. We did so for a long time in Payette. Make your own bread or just purchase some unleavened bread. Uh, there are other supplies that might need it. Paper, pens, utensils like that, things of that nature. Uh, Bibles, songbooks perhaps. 
all those things. All those things need to be provided, and so there is maintenance and there's service and work to be done. So whether or not, whether or not it's a man or a woman that's providing those services and taking care of those various needs, those people can be and at times should be provided for. Um, so, Keith, I'm, that's about all I have to say right now. I'm going to kick it over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Now, we, the question is, may a church pay a woman for her work? And then it says Christian and non-Christian. Um, well, let's look at, first of all, Trevor's 100% correct that there are limitations on what women can do for the church. And he mentioned the fact they cannot have authority. That's first over the, over the men. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. And so they cannot be in positions of authority, decision-making positions, over the men of the congregation. The men in the congregation have the rule. Uh, now, we're, we're supposed to have elders in every church, but we have to have men who are qualified to be elders. But at any rate, the women cannot be in those decision-making positions within the local church. But there are other things that women can do, including teaching, teaching women, teaching children, uh, and that's scriptural roles for women in the local church, and they can be paid for anything, whether they're Christian or non-Christian. Now, first of all, I would look at a specific example of a Christian. In Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, there is a woman that the Apostle Paul mentions by the name of Phoebe. This is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, so she's a, a sister in Christ, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. Now, we don't know what her service was. It doesn't say. So it could be anything that is the proper work of a woman and is the proper work of the church. She cannot be over the men. But anything that's the proper work of a woman and the proper work of the church Phoebe could have been doing. So she was a servant of the church in Sincrea. That you receive her in the Lord, now notice carefully, in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. That assistance could have been helping her out in doing something, or that assistance could be providing the funds that she needed in order to do those things. So either way, it is scriptural for the church to pay a sister in Christ to do anything that is the proper function of the church and is the proper work of a woman. But now what about a woman who is not a Christian? For example, would it be proper and, and scriptural to pay a woman who is not a Christian to clean the church building? Well, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus said, and this is the reason he gave for the disciples to be able to stay in one home, the apostles, when they're going out in the limited commission, the laborer is worthy of his hire. You ask somebody to do a work, you're obligated to pay them to do that work for you. If you don't want to pay them, don't ask them to do it. Now, the apostle Paul quotes that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, and applies it to the elders. But it's a general principle. The principle is, if you hire somebody to work for you, then you have an obligation to pay for them. Of course, if they want to refuse the pay, they can do that. But you have the obligation, if you ask them to do something you need done, to pay them for it, whether the person is a Christian or a non-Christian. You're paying for a service. It's your obligation. So I believe there is definite authority to pay a woman to do things for the church, as long as those things are in keeping with her role as a woman, and whether it's a Christian or a non-Christian, to pay her to do the things that the church asks her to do. All right, Trevor, let's go ahead to another question, please. This is a, uh, a more difficult question, I'd say. If Jesus is the same as God, why did Jesus pray to God? Well, that's a pretty deep question, Trevor, so let's talk about that. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot there. You know, let me, uh, let me talk about the first portion of the question, if Jesus is the same as God. Uh, well, Jesus is not just, I believe the Bible teaches, not just the same as God, but, but is God. And I want to go to John chapter 1 uh, to begin with here to, to understand some of this. John chapter 1, 
John chapter 1, and, and really beginning there in the first part of the chapter, uh, John says in the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. Now he's going to make it clear later in the text, the Word that he speaks of there is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, by the way, is not that Jesus had a beginning. Uh, the Bible teaches he's from everlasting, but rather it is talking about the beginning of creation, in the beginning there. So it's the beginning of our world that we know, the world that God created. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, so Jesus Christ, there is the Word. He was in the beginning with God. So there, there are other persons of God, if you will. We'll, we'll probably get into that a little bit later. But he also is God, or it says the Word was God there. And he was in the beginning with God. Then he goes on to talk about the creation. I mentioned the, con the context is the creation, the immediate first portion here. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So that's the beginning that he speaks of there in verse 1. So Jesus is God. The Word is God. Now, if you come down further in the text, come down to verse 14 there. He says, the Word became flesh. So this tells us he's talking about Jesus here. And, the, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so the word is Jesus Christ. He became flesh. John says he dwelt among us. We beheld him, beheld his glory. So that's the same word that he's talking about in verse 1. And the word was God, he says. Now, if you notice, uh, you know what, let, let's go back up to the beginning of chapter 1 there. Right after it talks about the creation in verse 3. In verse 4 it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, so in him was life. If you fast forward to the end of John's book, basically to the end, in chapter 20, and right at the end of chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John tells us why he wrote about all the things that Jesus did. He, he wrote about the signs that Jesus performed. And he says in that text that there were many other signs that Jesus did, which are not written in this book. But he goes on to say, these have been written, Verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So you look at the beginning of John's book, and he talks about Jesus being God, and that there is life in him. In him was life, he says in chapter 1, verse 4. And here in this text, here in this text in verse 31, he says, I have written these things so that you may believe in him and when you believe on him, then you have life in his name. God, life comes from God. God is life and light, and God gives us life, right? So he physically made the creation and physically breathed into man the breath of life and gave mankind life, brought us to life. And he is the one who gives spiritual life. So if you, if you kind of tie this together, John said that in Jesus is life. That's because he's God. You know, that can't be said of any mere man, in him is life. Well, we might be alive physically. We don't have the power to give life to anyone else, right? So in him is life. He is God. In this text here of, of chapter 20, verse 31, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and if you believe in him, there is life, having believed in his name. Now, Jesus himself told the people that he was God in John chapter 8, the same book. In John chapter 8, and in verse 58, and I know we haven't even gotten into the second portion of the question about Jesus praying to God, but uh, nonetheless, uh, because the question was worded the way it was, if Jesus is the same as God, I think it's important to understand that he is God. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, says to the people, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I am was the name that God gave to Moses. And so that is my name, God said. So I am, Jesus is saying, I am God. I have, I have that same name. So he is deity, he is God. So Jesus is not just the same, same as or like uh, somehow an equal to. He is equal to and is God. So he is with the Father and with the Spirit. Uh, there are three persons of God. This can be, be seen when Jesus is baptized. When Jesus was baptized, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, descended upon him and alighted upon him. And that's when Jesus began his ministry, by the way, and began performing those signs and wonders once the Holy Spirit came upon him. 
And then also there's a voice that came from heaven when he was baptized saying, this is my beloved son, hear him, or whom I am well pleased, excuse me. So this, uh, that, that text right there shows the persons of God, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And yes, we'll get into it, uh, I'm sure, that Jesus did pray to the Father as we're also supposed to do as well. But he is God. Um, Keith, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you for, for right now. Okay, thanks, Trevor. And yes, you've done an excellent job in establishing that he was not only the same as God. In fact, in John 8, 58, it says, made himself equal with God. Uh, and, and so certainly, uh, he's deity, but he also became human. There are several passages that uh, teach this and go into detail. I think the one that perhaps goes into the greatest detail is Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. In Hebrews chapter 1, the inspired writer in, introduces the book by saying, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, uh, whom he is, uh, who is before the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who be the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person or nature, and upon all things by the word of his power, we by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of God. So Hebrews chapter 1 presents Jesus as God, the Son of God, God's authorized spokesman. And he proceeds to quote seven Old Testament passages to prove that Jesus is God, that Jesus is deity. Then in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he tells us to listen to him since he is God's authorized spokesman. He's deity. He's God. Then he begins a, a great discussion, a wonderful discussion of the humanity of Jesus by quoting Psalm 8 where David says, uh, What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take account of him? And the Hebrew writer applies that passage to Jesus, that Jesus became a man. And then he gives seven reasons that Jesus had to become a man. And then look at Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able also uh, to aid those who are tempted. So Jesus was God, deity, equal with the Father. But Jesus became a man, human, equal to us in nature. Now that's what Paul calls in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, the mystery of godliness. It's something that is indeed pro, uh, profound for us to consider that he who was fully and completely God, always was, always shall be, was when he was upon the earth, fully and completely God, yet became fully and completely a human in every way, just as we are, even to the point that he prayed to God. Jesus is the great example of prayer. Uh, the book of Luke, more than any other New Testament book, presents the prayer life of Jesus. After Jesus was baptized, when he was coming out of the water, he was praying. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove. In Luke chapter 6, before he uh, called his disciples, the twelve, to become his apostles, he spent all night in prayer to God. I've thought about that a lot of times. I, I've never prayed that long. But Jesus continued all night in prayer to God. And of course, before he went to the cross, just before he was arrested, what do we remember? Jesus taking three of his apostles, going apart to a private place in the Garden of Gethsemane, falling on his face and praying, God, our Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Praying with such fervency that there fell from his face great drops of sweat as if they were blood. So Jesus, and we could give many of, before, before Jesus ever ate, there's, all, there's never a record of Jesus eating without giving thanks for his food. And that's a wonderful example for us. Whenever we eat, 
we ought to give God thanks for the food that we have. So Jesus is the greatest example of prayer, as he is the greatest example in all ways of serving God. Because Jesus was not only God, Jesus was also man. And by the way, we can put that in the present tense. Jesus is God, always has been, always will be. But Jesus became a man, and still in heaven he is a man. The man Christ Jesus is the one who is our mediator, according to Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He was always God. He became a man. Now he's both God and man. All right, Trevor, I'll turn it back to you. All right, yeah, you know, um, there are three persons, and you mentioned it, I mentioned it as well earlier, uh, of God, God the Father, God the Son, God, God the Spirit. Um, there does, there is an order the Bible teaches, though, um, and you know, in John chapter five, Jesus told the people that he and his father had been working. That's in verse seventeen. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And the Bible very clearly shows us this: that they are one. Uh, they are one in their focus and in their efforts and in their desires. John chapter seventeen in Jesus's prayer uh, to the Father. He brings this, this up, that they are one. And, and so God is one. And so Jesus works with the Father. They work together, and that text shows that. But the Lord Jesus also made it clear throughout his ministry here on earth that he came to do the will of the Father. And so it was by the authority of the Father that he did the things that he did and also spoke the things that he spoke. And that's very important for us to understand. In chapter 7 is one of these examples, and we're going to run out of time, so I'll keep this kind of brief. But in verse 28, it says, Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from, and I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. So Jesus makes it clear that he was sent by the Father. And, and again, uh, he didn't come of himself, he says. And he's basically telling the Jews there, they, they really don't know who God is. They would have recognized God in the person of Jesus Christ, that character of Christ. But they did not. They did not know God, and they didn't have the love of God. But nonetheless, Jesus says, I know him, and I've come from him. He sent me. And so he is, as the, the Hebrew writer says in chapter 1, he's the express image of God, the person of God. And so we can see what God looks like by seeing what Christ did in the flesh, his character. Um, here in this text right here, though, he was sent from God. And repeatedly throughout his ministry, again, he makes it very clear that he does the will of the Father. In fact, in chapter 14 of John, and in verse 28, again, I'll keep this very brief, he says, You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father. For the Father, or my Father, excuse me, my Father is greater than I. And so there is definitely an order that the Bible teaches that the Father uh, has authority. And the Father gave instructions to the Son. And the things that he spoke and heard in heavenly places, Jesus spoke those things on earth. Well, we're going to run out of time. But uh, hopefully maybe we'll have some time next, you know, to talk about this in the next episode a little more about prayer. But it is true. Jesus is God, and he also prayed to the Father. So we thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. If you have more questions about prayer, certainly submit those. But maybe we'll talk a little more about this particular subject next time. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654, and your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then... The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.